Welcome, everyone. Hi, I'm Diane Butler. I'm director of the Binghamton University Art Museum. And thank you all for coming on this lovely evening. So glad our event wasn't last night when we were you know, trying to find our car in the midst of snow. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be shortly introducing uh, some colleagues. But first, I do want to thank um, Mary O'Malley Trumbull. She is here, right here, of IBM. She really helped to make this exhibition possible. We so appreciate the support of IBM. And um, she's been just a delight to work with, so thank you very much. <laughs> I'd also like to thank for tonight's event, uh, both the Material and Visual Worlds and Sustainable Communities Transdisciplinary Areas of Excellence here at Binghamton University, really helped to make tonight's event uh, what it is. So to speak to the Material and Visual Worlds TA is Dan Davis, my colleague in the music department. I really just wanted to walk around that, and it was delightful. Um, yeah, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Diane. I'm Dan Davis. I am the chair of the Material Visual Worlds uh, Transdisciplinary Area and professor in the music department. Um, super excited to be partnering once again uh, with the Binghamton University Art Museum um, in uh, presenting. Uh, yet another experiment in our Distinguished Artist and Speaker Series um, with uh, this really exciting panel convened uh, this evening. Um, and I'm imagining Claire, you're going to talk about the workshop tomorrow as well, so I'll skip that part. Great. Um, but it's in the greenhouse, and I'm super excited about that, too. Um, uh, next up on the Material Visual Worlds uh, Speaker Series uh, on March 28th, no, excuse me, March 30th, I knew that I had that wrong. Um, at 4.30, uh, we have Gerhard Waldner from the University of Vienna, who's going to be in conversation uh, with a number of colleagues um, across departments here. Um, Carl Belarus from German Russian, Pam Smart from Art History, um, Gokhan Ersan from Art and Design, and Pam, I think that was everyone. Good, okay. And then on April 28th, these are floating around everywhere, I hope you have one yourself. Valerie Garber from Northern Illinois University, who is a medievalist talking about silk in the 19th century. So we hope you can join us for those. Um, and thank you all, and thanks for another fun time here. All right, be well, everybody. So as you mentioned, I'm Claire Kovacs. I am the curator of collections and exhibitions here at the Binghamton University Art Museum. And I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, and then Hopefully you'll hear very much less of me, unless I'm trying to wrangle this one in who's warned me that I can, I can tell him to stop talking um, because he has a tendency to be verbose. But before I um, get into that too much, I want to um, have a hearty thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. And I have a few quick notes of acknowledgement before, and before I get to those, I want, before I get to those who helped bring this exhibition and tonight's program to life, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we gather the unceded homeland of the Onondaga Nation of the Haudenosaunee, as well as numerous other indigenous people who are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. For many of us, our presence here is a settler presence enabled by the US government's removal of indigenous people from what is now the state of New York. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who have contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived here for more generations than can be counted. I pay respects to the elders of the Onondaga and Haudenosaunee peoples past and present, and I'd like us to take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, as well as those of displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Turning to this exhibition, I can only say that it takes a village. First and foremost, I see that there's folks. You're welcome to like come on in. There's seats upstairs. You can also sit on the stairs. I know. <laughs> there's some seats, of course, always up in the front um, if you're feeling brave. Uh, <laughs> so turning to this exhibition, I can only say it takes a village. First and foremost, I want to thank Nathaniel Stern for his generosity in sharing his work, wit, wisdom, and experience with the Binghamton community. 
to Nathaniel's team of undergraduate, to undergraduate students, too, who braved the Binghamton weather in January to install the exhibition and circuit boardwalk in the frigid cold ahead of an impending snowstorm. I keep telling them that they're bringing the snow from Wisconsin with them. And especially to Garrett, who is in the audience tonight, one of our, in the front row, um, one of Nathaniel's students who's made the trip here twice and uh, is about to undertake an de-install starting tomorrow at record speed. So thank you, Garrett. Speaking of Circuit Boardwalk, and if you haven't seen it, please check it out when it's not covered in snow, and it is not right now. I can say that because we just saw it. Uh, of course, it will also be on view in the spring, summer, and fall. There are many on campus who made that a success. Folks in the Campus Appearance Committee, the facilities crew who helped prep the area, Alessandra Segalini for designing, and Speed Pro for creating and installing the signage, designing the signage. Thanks to Josh DeMarie and Jay Sobel from the EW Higher Teaching and Research Greenhouses for graciously growing and lending us all the living plants in the exhibition. Our apologies for the few that are a little rougher for the wear. Uh, and thanks to Joe Kolar for videography this evening. My deep gratitude, too, to the staff of the Binghamton University Art Museum for all their support in this exhibition. Diane Butler, Sylvia Ivanova, Cynthia, Cynthia Riley, and Anne Ordway, who did an amazing job wrangling this exhibition as our new preparator. I think she's hiding in the back, but congratulations, Anne. I also want to thank Mark New Newton for his printing assistance and matting advice, to Alessandro Segolini for taking the lead on design in the exhibition, Sherry Casterlin and her staff for installing the signage, and to the museum interns engagement team for jumping into the deep end at the beginning of the semester to get the proverbial word out about this exhibition. And many of the interns are here tonight. You want to raise your hands if you're a Binghamton University Museum intern. There's a couple of them sitting around. Thank you. And I also want to thank them for a great pop-up event, uh, Seeds on the Spine with the Library Sustainability Hub. I want to thank the students, staff, and faculty who have engaged with the exhibition through classes and events from Renee Neville's community dance performance, What Remains, to Renna Magazine's fashion show, The Nature of Time, that happened here last weekend. And I want to close this long list with an echo of gratitude to our sponsors of the event for this exhibition, IBM, as well as Material and Visual Worlds and the Sustainable Communities TAEs. How about some quick applause for Claire for wrangling all of those? <laughs> I also want to invite y'all back for our opening, our next opening, March 24th. We will be opening Joy, Play, and Resistance in the work of Miguel Luciano and Hiram Mirastani. Miguel will be here at 4.30 talking about the exhibition, and the reception will be running from 5 to 7, so I hope to see you back here for that. So those are all my thank yous. I thought maybe I'd do some introductions now, so you know who's sitting on stage, well, <laughs> proverbial stage, in front of our big wall uh, after us. Uh, and so I want to introduce the folks sharing this stage with me for Imagination Science Collaborations in the World After Us. First, Nathaniel Stern, sitting just to my right. He's an artist and writer, NEA Fulbright NSF grantee and professor, interventionist, and public citizen. Stern holds a joint appointment as professor of art and design in the Peck School of the Arts and mechanical engineering in the College of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He's a research associate at the Research Center, Faculty of Art and Design and Architecture at the University of Johannesburg. And he's also the director of UWM's Startup Challenge. He practices aesthetic activism, arts thinking, design pedagogy, and engineering processes. He's produced and collaborated on projects ranging from ecological participatory and online interventions, interactive, immersive, and mixed reality environments to prints, sculptures, videos, performances, and hybrid forms. He's written a number of fascinating books, including Interactive Art and Embodiment, The Implicit Body as Performance, and Ecological Aesthetics, Artful Tactics for Humans, Nature, and Politics, as well as, and this is one of my first, let's we are sitting in my lap here, this fantastic catalog for the show, which, hey, there are copies available in the gift shop. They're signed copies. Uh, you could probably get him to sign it more if you ask him really nice afterwards. Uh, so that great catalog that you can, you can check out. He's been featured in the likes of Wall Street Journal, Guardian, DK, Huffington Post, Daily Mail, Washington Post, Daily News, BBC's Today Show, Wired, Gizmo, Time, Forbes, Fast Company, Scientific American, 
the Milwaukee Journal, Sentinel, Leonardo Journal of Art, Science, and Technology, Rhizome, Further Field, and more. So that's Nathaniel. Welcome. <laughs> I'm going to run down the list. Um, so next to Nathaniel is, uh, is Constantine. I forgot to ask you. So Sobolev, thank you. See, I normally do this ahead of time, and I failed. Uh, but Constantine Sobolev, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at UW Milwaukee, whose research focuses on high-performance cement-based composites, application of nanomaterials in construction, and in waste utilization. He's on the editorial board of Nature Scientific Reports and is a collaborator on Circuit Board Walk, which I was talking about earlier. Again, if you haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. It's at the south entrance to the engineering building. So, welcome, Constantine. Next to Constantine is, I'm just making sure I can see, is uh, Johannes Lehmann, who is the Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor at the School of Intricative, Intricative Plant Science, Soil, and Crop Sciences section, as well as the Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University. He focuses his research and teaching in soil biogeochemistry and soil fertility management. His specialization is in soil organic material and nutrient studies of managed natural ecosystems with a focus on soil carbon sequestration, nutrient recycling from waste, biochar systems, circular, circular economy, and sustainable agriculture in the tropics, especially on the African continent. His research stretches from the ultra-fine scale micros microscopy to examine carbon stabilization in soils to global scale carbon and nutrient cycles. And of course, he's a collaborator with Nathaniel on this project, The World After Us. And then last but certainly not least is Sasha Style. She is a poet, artist, and AI researcher probing the intersection of text and technology. Her cross-media work, which has been honored in future art awards, nominated for a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net, exhibited in analog and virtual realms and published as NFTs, seeks to decipher the hidden language of drawing, the, of the dawning noticing, using elements of semiotics, translation, and computer science, speculative design, and visual poetry as well as conceptual art. Sasha is known for her binary-based projects such as Cursive Binary that challenge reductive thinking, merging biological, mechanical, analog and digital, and historical and modern explanations of transhuman communication and transcendent possibility. Many of her projects incorporate elements of nature, investigating non-human intelligence and the ethos of consciousness. Sasha's hybrid poetry and artwork has been exhibited at Miami Art Week, featured in the official Times Square app on virtual New Year's Eve, shown on the runway at New York Fashion Week, installed as land art, and streamed in digital screens across France. Her fantastic book, Technology, Technology is forthcoming from Black Spring Press, and I have to say it's fantastic, so, so definitely, so definitely check it out. So, join me in welcoming these fantastic panelists. <laughs> if I could just latch on, um, where Constantine has a collaborator on uh, Sorkin Borbach and Johannes was a collaborator on this exhibition. Sasha is my collaborator on my next huge project, and that's where she fits into the panel. Yes, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is, this is a, a conversation about collaborations, present and future. So, yes, uh, so with that, I'm going to get started so you can stop listening to me and listen to the folks up here this evening. So your first question, and keep it short, is what do y'all do? Like, sort of talk to me about what your work is, help orient the audience, and then we'll get into what you're all doing together. Okay? Whoever wants to start. I uh, work in the uh, field of concrete, and I investigate uh, uh, different aspects of uh, concrete technology, making concrete more durable, and more sustainable, but also introduce new functionalities to concrete. So, to have another dimensions which uh, we are not expecting from this main uh, construction material. For example, we can incorporate uh, properties which are uh, uh, unusual for concrete, like photocatalytic properties, 
um, photovoltaic properties, self-cleaning properties, stress sensing properties, we make concrete magnetic, for example. So we introduce all new dimensions into this old material. And it's actually, we consider it old material, but a well-established material. But as a material, it's relatively new, actually. Modern concrete is a relatively new material. And we use it a lot. And I think uh, uh, the, the work we do in my lab can really transform the way concrete is going to be manufactured in the future. So the very small impact on, because of the scale, very small impact on the way we produce concrete, we apply concrete in the future, may have enormous global impact. And we talk about sustainability, we talk about recycling, and I think uh, uh, this is where like major impact can be made. And again, uh, I'm dealing with concrete most of my life, so I will keep uh, keep uh, keep doing it. I think, and uh, and uh, um, we collaborated with Nathaniel on a number of different projects, art related. So concrete is also not only main construction material, but also wonderful material for different to express your uh, imagination, to make creative shapes and sculptures. And uh, one of this. Uh, project uh, is really um, here at the exhibition for which we can have a look at this. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hey, Sasha, do you want to talk about your work? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having us and for the kind introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm, as you said, I'm a, a poet as well as an artist and an AI researcher, so I, um, I've been writing poetry pretty much my entire life. I've also been sort of obsessed with science and technology my entire life. I grew up in a household uh, really just um, steeped, in, steeped in the sciences in various ways, and I think that's just kind of woven together in my, in my brain and in my practice. So I've been writing, actually, about technology for decades, now, and my, my poetry practice has sort of evolved over time to actually integrate new media, integrate digital tools as, uh, as medium, as uh, a subject, using it in different ways, conceptually. So at, at this point, I think I'm kind of weaving together text and technology in, in ways that I hadn't really envisioned when I was, when I was a you know, poetry student way back when. Um, one of the, you know, the most interesting things for me right now is working with AI, uh, natural language processing. So uh, working with artificial intelligence, specifically in an area um, called N NLP, natural language processing, which is sort of a combination of computer science and linguistics and artificial intelligence that looks at how we can use neural nets to um, ingest vast quantities of human speech. and. Um, and process that information, analyze it, synthesize it, and then turn around and actually imitate us and, uh, and, and talk to us in ways that sound very human. So I'm really interested um, as, a, as a writer in being able to use technologies like artificial intelligence in my practice, thinking about what it means for me as a writer to be able to work with uh, these incredible, vast, uh, you know, incredibly powerful language models um, what that means for me as an author, what that means for me as a collaborator working with machines. Um, so that's kind of where my, my head has been at, uh, you know, lately. And I think, you know, also relevant to, to this amazing exhibition and this conversation, I do a lot of work with nature as well, um, writing and translating and coding from human language into elements of nature and incorporating the question of how nature and technology are related to one another. Um, in a lot of my work. So um, again, very, very happy to, to, to be here. I think I never thought as a poet I'd be able to be in a discussion with a concrete engineer and soil scientist, let alone with Daniel and Claire. So this is really cool. Thank you so much. Johannes, you want to fill us in a little bit? Thank, thank you very much. Now it's really a privilege to be here together and, and in this space and, and talk about um, interdisciplinarity. I, I started off working in uh, sustainable agricultural systems in West Africa and Togo on agroforestry and then spent three years in Kenya working on irrigation before ending up uh, for three years in the central Amazon in Manaus working on sustainable agriculture. Um, and, and they are got intrigued by, um, by very uh, resilient and persistent soils in the Amazon called locally Kea uh, the black earths made by the Indians. And, um, and, and the, it turned out that these soils 
were made um, by Amerindian populations thousands of years ago and remain very fertile in an otherwise very infertile soil scape. And that intrigued me um, to, to dig deeper and understand what, what made these soils tick. Um, and it turned out that, that uh, they, they uh, retained their fertility because they were full of uh, charcoal or what we then dubbed biochar. Um, and, and thinking fundamentally about um, you know, what's, what's in the world around us, how are soils made, um, what's the diversity of organisms and compounds that are in there, what, what makes soil tick is, is really interesting. And, and learning from, from these um, uh, uh, traditional soil management techniques, on very often questioning whether they are really management techniques or just, just accidents, just lessons that we can learn from something that happened before us. Um, and, and trying to see what that means for, for today's uh, challenges in, in, in sustainability, whether they're soils or climate change. That is really um, what, what intrigues me. And that eventually, I think on a very fundamental level, um, made me be intrigued by how artists think and how artists work. And that's why, sort of in a circuitous way, uh, um, uh, I, I, I ended up here as well. Thank you, All right, Daniel, what do you do? Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good. Cool, cool. And I see that there's folks in the back. There's, there's seats up here in front. Yeah. You can come on in. You don't have to hang out in the back. Of it. Thanks for being here. I know you're all about to go on spring break. Uh, and so I, I appreciate seeing how we've worried. We weren't going to have a, too big of a crowd. And great to see so many lovely faces here. Um, I probably spent most of my time answering email, uh, like all of you. Uh, I change a lot of diapers, I have five children, but um, uh, as someone in an art department, an engineering department, and at an entrepreneurship center, I like to say I teach artists how to engineer, engineers how to art, and everyone how to sustain their passions. Um, and for me, that the, the sustenance of passion, um, I, I never knew that's how I would define entrepreneurship, but um, I think one question I, I often ask is, you know, Every generation is asked to save the world, more or less, and, and what if we're the ones who, who actually do it? And so I try to surround myself with people who are smarter than me and more talented than me, and, and put them in dialogue to address um, problems that not only have not yet been solved, but perhaps have not yet been articulated. And so I, I think the job of the artist as public figure is to frame and amplify who and how we are, but more importantly, ask how we could be. And so the project of this show, um, which, and I think, if you know me, and you look at my, the history of my work, you know, spanning from you know, academic publications to large-scale exhibitions to startups, um, they, it makes sense in terms of the questions I've asked, but if you compare a show with another show, you wouldn't necessarily think it was the same artist. Um, and it's because I'm, I'm always kind of asking a series of questions. I'm highly influenced by those around me. Um, and, I, and I think it's uh, vital for us to continuously question both our intimate relationships to the immediate things around us, uh, the systemic uh, problems and situations that we have to lobby for in a much greater system than we are aware of in the day to day, but also inspire new teachers. Uh, and, and so that those intimate, systemic, and inspirational relationships are what I try to get at in these various dialogues and conversations I get to have with amazing people. So I think that the, you've set me up really well for the next question, which is, how do these relationships fit and work together? So, so how, how did y'all start collaborating? What do you do in terms of your collaborations? Looks like Constantine wants to start that. Um, Yes, so, uh, well, we, uh, I think with Nathaniel, we uh, collaborated in Italy like, for 10 years and maybe like uh, exchange of years. And uh, obviously we exchange uh, our, our uh, problems and uh, solutions and what we are, you know, occupied with. And I think very often we have uh, something that's clicking there that we choose uh, Resulting as a new idea, and uh, we uh, very often we just simply decided, okay, let's go and give it a try. And uh, I think we both are blessed that we have uh, good teams of students, 
which uh, can be easily inspired and ignited by our ideas. And they come together and they create something which we uh, envision. And I think this is, uh, this, is, this is the beauty of this cooperation that we can dream about something and uh, have uh, such ideas, but those ideas can be materialized. Yeah. Well, I think in relatively easy and smooth ways, right? So I think uh, I think this is most important for us. So be creative, work together, realize our dreams, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present them here. I think this is important for us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I think uh, my two most important collaboration tools that I like to talk about are um, beer and deadlines. Uh, <laughs> so beer is both metaphoric. You have to really like your collaborators. Like when people ask how I find my collaborators, I don't say like, oh, I need a computer scientist. Like but as an artist and an engineer, I know that when an engineer asks me to collaborate, most of the time they mean, can you make my stuff pretty? And when an artist asks me to collaborate, they really mean, I have an idea, will you code it for me? So I'm much more interested in developing relationships with people where I, where I actually want to, like the best collaborations are like if you want to make their art and they want to make your art. If you want to do it, if you would quit your job to work for them. But also there has to be a, a, a significant amount of personal respect and understanding. Like you, you, I really, I, you don't have to be friends with someone in the workplace, but you do have to have a, a good personal relationship with a collaborator because things are going to happen where you have to understand each other and your roles and what's important to you and what you value and what your values are. And then, on top of that, you know, it's true, you and I for years talking, 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 but when did it finally happen? Well, when we got the proposal accepted for the exhibition. Um, so deadlines, real or imagined, are the only way I get anything done. Most of the time, I'm working on a project because I'm procrastinating another project. <laughs> Thank you. You, you, wanna, you wanna talk about how, how we met? And I mean, these are both really interesting stories, actually. Well, um, it wasn't started with an email yeah. um, and uh, and reaching out and 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 then it, it starts with uh, continue with play um, and and actually I, I like the word play and and when we recently put it into a paper that we submitted for publication and some of the scientists objected to the word play um, because they thought that now that we're not playing um, but I, I think in, in our case we, we started to play and uh, and, and he sent me some stuff, and I put it into an oven, and some of this you see around here, it's mostly black or deformed, or uh, does Actually, this the, and that the, the other. The little tubes, the little bottles over there were our first experiments. So I emailed him and said, hey, I, I heard you cook plants. Can you, can you cook some yeah, and I said, cassette what? tapes and computers? Yeah. And he was oh, like, you're an artist, you're cool. Let's hang oh, out. We, we, we don't do that, but let's try it. Um, and I have never thought about doing that um, because that sounds like a stupid idea. And of course, it, uh, <laughs> of I course, have lots of them. Yeah, we have exactly. So stupid ideas are actually great um, because you do something that you would never do on your own and then and then something else happens. And, uh, and, and, and then, no, it, it, it continued with, with um, also empowering me to do something that I would never have done, not only on instruction, but also say, why don't you do something? And then I started thinking, oh boy, yes. Um, and uh, um, but maybe that's not what I typically do, <laughs> uh, start thinking. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting to, to have a challenge. Um, and, uh, and, and think outside the box, um, and for a scientist to think like an artist, or at least to try to explore what it means to think like an artist, or to practice like an artist, is, is, uh, is, is, is very eye-opening. And, and as, as Nathaniel said, it's really, it's really great um, to be able to have an interaction where, where the artist is not uh, degraded to illustrating uh, complicated things, um, or the scientists to make something happen um, uh, because we have a technique, but but to 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 meet halfway, or or to pull the other one over and explore their uh, their territory, and 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 then surprising things happen, and uh, and um, we we started then um, thinking about about question creation. I, it, it always bugged me that that we've been uh, as scientists uh, rushing to answers um, when. When it turns out that, that artists and art practice is, is really asking a lot of questions, um, maybe not providing as many answers. And, and I, now that's when we started to think about um, a question machine. 
what if I have in my lab, in my science lab, not machines that create answers, but machines that create questions? Because I think the greatest breakthroughs are not when we find an answer to a question that somebody posed, but actually to find the new question. Um, and that's, that is really, um, of turning that on its head uh, is, is really interesting. And that's sort of the fundamental thoughts about um, that, that come together when, when, when people from oppo opposing polls, or it's not even polls, I'm not even sure what it is, um, but, but uh, that think very different and practice very different, have different incentive structures. Um, uh, work together and, and start talking. Thanks so much. Sasha, do you want to talk a little bit about, as, as Nathaniel brought up, that, that your collaborations are, are in the future, but maybe talk about the beginnings of that? Yeah, for sure. Well, I will, I'll say that actually our, our, I think our relationship actually began with this show when it was in a previous, previous incarnation, and I encountered it from afar. And um, just given the work that I was doing, um, I just I saw images from this particular show and was instantly struck in kind of the way that it's almost like you know a, a, an artistic like instant you know, love at first sight kind of thing where I just saw this work and was like there's something here that I really want to explore more and spend more time with. And we didn't know each other at all, obviously. And then just the, the way these things work, somehow Twitter brought us together. <laughs> Um, in a magical way, and we just, I think we have a, a lot of mutual interest in each other's work, and we see a lot of overlaps, but we also see a lot of differences, kind of as Johannes was just saying. I'm coming from a perspective that's very heavy on the words, and even though Nathaniel has also been, you know, is also a poet and has also done a lot of linguistic work, you know, I see this is coming from a different perspective, and so our first sort of um, desire to collaborate together came out of this recognition that if we could take some of the work that I was doing with language that I didn't really have visuals for necessarily, and if we could use that and kind of play around with these amazing visuals, these amazing sculptures, and these manifestations of ideas that were coming out of Nathaniel's practice, that we could maybe create some kind of a third um, thing, third entity to, uh, to add to what's already being discussed and, and uh, explored in exhibitions like this one. So um, our, our first collaboration really has, it actually is kind of in the present because it has to do a lot with the show. Um, I'm actually custom training, and have been doing this for a little while now, but I'm custom training an AI generator based on the catalog that Claire showed earlier. Um, it, it kicks off with an amazing poem in the beginning, so I was, you know, instantly sort of mesmerized by opening the catalog and seeing this incredible um, you know, cascade of poetic words about this show, and then reading the essays, reading Nathaniel's words, reading the words of contributors, just made me think, well, I would love to be in conversation with this show in some way. I'd love to interact with it. I'd love to understand it more, more than just, you know, reading the book. So I trained this AI to, to sort of think a little bit like Nathaniel, but then also think a little bit like me, and I've input my poetry, I've input my references, my, my interest in nature and technology. So essentially this, this generator that we've developed is kind of this locus for collaboration. And in some ways it's a little bit like a third collaborator. It's this kind of um, uncanny non-human collaborator that is able to kind of um, look at everything from a very high up level. Um, and at the same time, parse everything down to the smallest detail and the smallest nuance, and is able to kind of synthesize all of that and summarize it and, and mirror it back to us in a way that I don't think either of us would be able to do on our own. So um, that's sort of that's kind of our, our our kickoff collaboration is starting with this show and thinking about it through an AI non-human intelligence uh, perspective and seeing where that takes us poetically. Um, and then, you know, we were actually having a, a great call the other day with Johannes, too, about this idea of this question machine. And I think something that all of us here have in common is this desire to pose hypotheses. And I, I know that in my poetic practice, even the beginning of my book is just a list of questions that I'm thinking about. It's sort of the things that I'm guided by. Um, so I think we all really resonate with each other on, on that level of really wanting to um, to, to open up questions as opposed to offering answers. And so out of this discussion of, uh, of using AI language, 
we've sort of been kicking around this, this notion of, well, maybe we can actually use the vastness of learning models and, uh, and almost create this collective global consciousness that can help us pose ideas, pose questions that, the, you know, that, that those of us who are up on stage right now wouldn't think to ask. Um, and, and really use technology in a way to kind of, um, I don't know, serve as a little bit of, um, you know, a, an augmented imagination and uh, help us access kinds of creativity, creative thought that we might not be able to get in touch with otherwise. So I think, yeah, we're, we're playing a lot with how to use technology in this collaboration while also, you know, very much um, uh, linking to each other on a human level and connecting um, from these very different disciplines that we're all in and looking at the really, you know, incredible kind of nexuses and low, uh, you know, moments of intersection where very different disciplines come together and spark um, really original and unique thoughts. I think, you know, yes, that's okay. shocking. <laughs> um, Design thinking, and specifically the D school at Stanford's way of approaching design thinking, has gotten a lot of play in the last decade, and for good reason. Um, but very often, then, art and design have been conflated a little too much. Um, and especially with design thinking's uh, kind of very focal thinking around um, user centric empathy and a very set process, I think we forget that art's thinking is significantly different. Um, design thinking sympathizes or empathizes with a specific person or user and defines a problem and then attempts to solve it. Arts thinking is really dumping a garbage bag on the table and seeing what you can make. And it's not to say that artists don't design and designers don't art, if you will. But to me, when you're brainstorming and design thinking, it's when you run out of ideas, right? And you're throwing up all the post-it notes and then finally you reach the bottom of the barrel and you, you fold in this blue or that light, the sky, the green, the hostess cupcake, and the environment around you gets folded in. Well, that's why artists confuse material and discipline, because printmakers think in ink. And when you paint, that is your medium and your discipline. And so what I love about being an artist is that kind of material play where it shows me something or teaches me something, those happy accidents, that spilling on the floor, of Jackson Pollock, right? And I think what we forget is that this happens in science too. You know, that, this, that some of the most important and best discoveries everywhere have been these material investigations that taught us something and showed us something. And I think this is where all of us are sympathetic. I mean, hearing you speak, you treat data as material, Sasha. You, you teach language as a material, as something that teaches you things that you didn't know before. Um, Brian Sunni writes about how he loves writing in such a way that he didn't think he thought the things that he thinks, and to see where that writing might lead him. And so I'm, I'm very thrilled to get to work with, to me, working with scientists, working with engineers who work with materials <laughs> makes perfect sense in terms of that kind of material and artistic investigation, even if we think and are disciplined differently. Well, sometimes we have to be undisciplined. So I'm going to take that another step and ask you all, what are the stakes of this work? So, so we've talked about why or how you've come to the table, but let's, let's get to the why. What are the stakes here? I don't know. Who wants to why don't we start with you? We'll, we'll, we'll flip it. We'll flip it. Um, for this particular show, then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, in some ways, there's the kind of obvious problematic of our waste and, and how far it's gone. Um, in some ways, there's also the implicit understanding of, of energy use, energy storage, um, and carbon sequestration. Uh, I, I think for me, the, the stakes in this work are, you know, and, and what I'm trying to live materially, right? Because I think there always has to be a connection between what we see or experience, why that's important, and then where that lives in the work and, and where the stakes are. And very often, you know, I tell my graduate students, just because you were reading Foucault when you made this work, that does not mean it's about power. Right? Like, <laughs> you, you can't will this into existence. And so, you know, for me, there's this effective and overwhelming sense of, of waste here. 
But there's also a kind of hopefulness, right? I, I kind of, I, 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 someone told me, like, oh, this is so solar pump. I'm like, yeah, it's so solar pump. What the F is solar pump? And so I had to look it up. And cyberpunk is, you know, this dystopian future. Solar pump is the notion that we can be hopeful, not necessarily optimistic, but hopeful that we might make change. And so there's this overwhelming aspect of sense that, you know, John and I were just saying, both of us had this yellow phone in our kitchen. Like, I have a relationship with these things around me. They're mine. And so what I, what I said earlier, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna repeat it again now. Like, I want us to have an intimate relationship with our waste. I want us to remember, read dash member, and body again, that these are not just tools, but these are things, right? What would happen if every single one of us in this room, if every single one of us at Manhattan University, and every single one of us in New York kept our phones for one extra year instead of upgrading? What would that do? Every single person <laughs> saved our phones for one more year. So that's our intimate relationship. That would make a future. Then there's the systemic change. Did you know it's illegal to export used phones to other countries? Like, if you go to a developing world, most of their phones that they buy new don't do as much as the phones that we give back and buy new. And you, but we can't export them. Why? Because the companies that make the phones make way more money. If they sell new phones, even if the new phones don't do as much as our old phones. We don't regulate waste. We don't regulate what happens to the raw materials when we dig them up. We care about what we put into our bodies, like the FDA. Why don't we care about what we put into the environment just as much? But then there's also that last moment of the inspirational change. Like, to me, my favorite audience is younger than me. <laughs> my favorite audience are my students that help me build this show, because I want to inspire them to go into all of these fields and save the world. <laughs> Right? And that's not to put it off my generation to do that either, but rather, we need to, we're beyond the point of uh, simplistic thinking where we, like moving to green energy now is not gonna be enough. It's not, we're beyond that point. Like we need to think radically about carbon sequestration. We need to revisit, I know I'm gonna raise some eyebrows, nuclear energy. <laughs> we need to understand how sodium ion batteries might be able to replace lithium ion batteries in such a way that we're no longer using cobalt or transporting batteries and energy in order to make more energy, but it's using too much energy to get it here in the first place. And so I, I really feel as if these three points of contact, our intimate relationship where we think carefully about everything we own and have and do and throw away and use, this systemic understanding of how much change needs to happen and this radical understanding of what we have to do for the future because we can do it, but we can't do it on any of the trajectories we're currently going on. Excellent. Does anybody want to jump in and Maybe I can kind of few Yeah, go for it. Um, you see, I mentioned already that I'm dealing with concrete, and concrete is actually, you know, very large commodity which can absorb actually enormous amount of supplementary and tissues materials which known to us as waste and byproducts. And uh, uh, the goal of this project, so when actually the, the concrete block tile uh, with uh, uh, circuit boards were inspired by this specific exhibition because when Nathaniel just had this idea and he explained it to me and he said I have the circuit boards I want to torture them, I want to burn them, I want to destroy them. And I said, look, I have this idea because we have so much concrete waste in my lab, and it is research waste because we produce concrete in the lab. We have different formulations, and instead of throwing it, actually, I was making weird blocks, which were wonderful, actually, as uh, uh, artistic shapes, you know. So I demonstrated to Nathaniel, and I said, look, this is what we are doing. We are also trying to say the waste we produce, so it's not sent to landfill, and uh, it can be like one of the object of your exhibition. So we started to discuss more, and we came to this idea that we use concrete, which is wasted already, like, uh, because we produce samples. We have different compositions, we mix them together, and finally we have these blocks. So instead of blocks, we combine the circuit boards, 
in a country which was research based in the in the lab. And uh, but generally for me it is important to demonstrate that concrete can be used as a, can be a very sustainable material, can be long lasting, and also can be used as a as a uh, as a venue to recycle many of byproducts, like for example some of the ash produced by uh, by recycling of electronic waste can easily go there. Some uh, circuit boards which can be powerized or crushed can be used as an aggregate potentially. It doesn't mean that concrete will be better than you know virgin concrete. It may be, may not be the case. But the idea is again, concrete will, uh, is uh, potentially a great venue for recycling, for sustainability. And also, uh, as I mentioned, for me, it is still wonderful material which can be shaped to any shape and it can be really helping you to express yourself like your vision. And this is the direction I like to continue working with Nathaniel. So again, uh, we can do some magic there. We can uh, utilize almost any byproduct, I would say, plastic waste, organic waste, or inorganic waste into the composition and we can create something useful and so have second life for, for those products. So this is why this project is important for me and this is why I'd like to continue working with the team and uh, continue, continue this, this, uh, uh, this work. I think uh, art science projects and interfaces are, are, are really fertile but I think uh, the, 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 the fate of humanity, the fate of the planet is at stake on so many levels and, uh, and this is one approach um, and maybe for me that's the, the most important way to come to, uh, to new, new approaches to thinking and um, human decision making is probably the, the most wicked problem that we're facing. Uh, a lot of technologies are known. I can tell you solutions to many things that in my in my area, how to fix the climate, how to fix water quality. But the problem is we're not doing it. Um, and, uh, and and so writing another scientific paper with another solution uh, that is technology and uh, is is probably not cutting it. Um, we need to deal with human decision making, and that's just difficult. And and I. I do think that um, when the scientists and engineers think like artists and artists think like scientists, um, then, then we're getting somewhere um, because we, we, we need to contend with, with, uh, with human decision making. And actually, it's kind of interesting to think about AI uh, and human decision making because that might be actually very often the way we can now start unlocking some of the, uh, the, the, the deadlock of of uh, wrong decision making. What, what are really, how can we trick ourselves um, into doing something that actually is in our own benefit when otherwise we wouldn't? I usually put cheese on top of my kid broccoli. I mean, I think <laughs> exactly. Really Perfect flavor to grab cheese. a beer or something. Yeah, right? broccoli. Um, and uh, yeah, I, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. So we just, uh, I was driving down with a colleague, Rebecca Nelson, and we were talking about um, uh, how. Uh, one, one way how farmers in upstate New York um, might buy into dealing with uh, dairy manure differently than what they do and how can we get um, less phosphorus and nitrogen in, our, in, our, in the finger lakes um, might be through odor control. Uh, not because um, of the regulations, we, there's a way to really enforce the regulations on, on nitrogen and phosphorus load or to entice them to do something for the climate, but they are really concerned with um, uh, the good relations with their neighbors. So if that's really the trigger for buying into a better way of handling dairy manure through my daily interactions with my neighbor, then maybe we can find a way of, of, uh, of do, achieving all the other sustainability outcomes as well. And, and, and I think those, those kind of new ways of thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that in, in, in these new um, collaborations with, with those who are thinking about AI in a different way, um, 
because I, I use a lot of AI um, when when I'm uh, have too many parameters to contend with uh, that it can happen uh, any which way. But but I think human decision making is is very often elusive uh, in these computations. So so I think I'm, I'm very curious how how artists think about and use AI in a way that that might help us uh, figure out how we can how we can uh, deal with with humans. Um, they're they're very terrible terrible beings. <laughs> Just on. Well, one of the things that I love most about working with AI is that it really takes me to places that shock me and surprise me on a regular basis. And I get so bored listening to myself trying to free write or you know coming up with a phrase that you know doesn't sound like another phrase that I've written. And it's so exciting to just to be there with with this machine and to know that it's thinking kind of like me or kind of you know like like other you know poets that I've trained it to think like. But it's, it's bringing something so unexpected to the table, and that's where the real creativity and that's where the real innovation comes in. So I think, again, so exciting to think about taking something that, you know, for example, that I'm exploring maybe in a more aesthetic way and finding functional applications for it, finding ways that it could actually do something, do something to try you know, and, and impact these problems that, that we've been talking about. So I think I 100% agree with that, and I'm very excited to see, to see how this all goes. It really surprises me that there is still this um, this idea, this notion that art and science are uh, kind of like a binary, like that they're kind of opposed to each other in some way. That art um, that art is you know uh, kind of enigmatic and mysterious and soulful, and science is very rigorous and methodical. And it's just it's not. I'm sure. Well, we can debate it, but I'm sure that you, you, you probably agree with that as well. And I think that's how I feel about my work with poetry and technology as well, that you know, people often say, well, if you're a poet, you should be really focusing on like, things that are very you know, human and soulful and artistic, and isn't technology soulless, and isn't it too mechanical? And are, you know, are these two things related at all? And, and I think, to me, the most exciting outcomes are when you really juxtapose, um, you juxtapose things that are not maybe thought to go together, maybe not meant to go together. And again, it really yields outcomes that I, you know, I think are, are what, we, what we need. They're the solutions that we haven't been able to access yet. Uh, and I often think about, um, you know, I grew up in a household that idolized Carl Sagan, uh, who to me was just this epitome of a poet and, you know, and a scientist. And knew, yeah, and, and knew that, that science is poetry and that poetry is science and that art you know, that, that science is all about imagination and creativity. And to be able to, to be able to imagine something that's never existed before, to be able to come up with a concept of gravity or to understand, you know, how the universe operates on a massive scale, those are leaps of imagination that I almost can't, I mean, I can't comprehend. That's, to me, just the essence of what science is, is just, is using that, that creativity. And to me, artists and scientists are so aligned in that way. So we're all coming from very different disciplines, very different areas of, of, of you know areas of, uh, of expertise. But we can and we should all bring these areas together um, so that we can you know, pool our knowledge, see how all these different bits and pieces collide, and then you know see where see where it takes us. An interesting question then is also about where. How much discipline do we need to be interdisciplinary? Uh, no, is it necessary that we come from different areas and does that ignite a spark? Um, or, and I think in the academy that's, that's always a question. Do, do we, do we, should we train interdisciplinary um, uh, scholars or, or do we need to have disciplines and then meet in the middle? Um, and that's a good question to ask how, how, how universities should address that in the future. I think the future is a really, you're just doing a really good job of helping me set up for um, these different questions. Uh, so the, the last question that I'm going to ask y'all is, and then we're going to have some time to take questions from the audience, is what's next? Well, uh, I think for, for me, uh, I've always got uh, six or seven dozen projects uh, happening in the studio, six or seven dozen children at my house. Um, but uh, uh, coming out of this exhibition, um, one of the, the smaller things I'm doing, there's a sculpture over here 
called uh, Time Pieces. It's a sodden half bone that is an hourglass and the sand. Kevin can show it to us. Yeah. Like, there, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> over the, every new exhibition, we put a new phone in there, and over the course of the exhibition, the sand slowly rips the phone further and further apart. Um, so it's a kind of fossilizing form. I really loved that piece, and so I'm working with another collaborator on a series of five kinetic sculptures. So it's a smaller series of works. One of them is uh, breathing moss. Uh, another is a breathing tornado machine. So the tornado actually looks like a lung that inhales and exhales. So just a, a series of kind of material investigations, not dissimilar to these, but using um, data and ecological data. So uh, the air quality might decide how the tornado machine the bigger exhibition that I'm working on coming out of this is a whole series of collaborations with Sasha. Uh, and so that's that's part of the exciting thing that came out of this. We were, as she mentioned, we were independently fans of each other's work before we actually got to meet. Uh, and this is the first time we're actually meeting in person, although we've had many hours long phone conversations and Zoom calls. And we have, we've already started three collaboration, uh, smaller collaboration projects, but we see a two to three year horizon line continuing our exploration of the world after us, or as she put it, the word after us, um, where we want to look at not only uh, human potential and creativity around intimate and systemic change, but potentially non-human creativity, um, and uh, explore how we might collaborate with our machine overlords, excuse me, with our waste, excuse me, with computers, excuse me, with artificial intelligence, remember, is in this moment. It is aggregate intelligence. It is trained on us. And so our, all, any faults that it produces, like as is commonly referred to, racism, come out of it being trained on our own models of language and tagging and labeling, etc. And so going in with um, a sensitivity, but also an openness in and around what might come out. It's early stages. This exhibition um, was you know, three years in the making uh, and, and came from many of brainstorm sessions with many students where, honestly, we just wanted to know what would happen when we stuck that iPhone 6 in a vitamin mix, um, and so on and so forth. And so I'm very excited to be collaborating with um, Sasha on that. Uh, body of work, which is already starting as generative and AI and code based, is, is working with Johannes on a new version of the question machine, which will be uh, an aggregate intelligence, um, and which will materialize words in new and different ways with these, these other collaborators too. So we're, we're planning to see literal concrete poetry and looking at uh, casting stone. <laughs> cast stone, right. Uh, we're looking at um, circular economies both as words to train computers on um, in order to ask scientific questions, but then also potentially looking at those same economies of soil and poop and manure and cooking those into sculptures that ask questions. And, uh, and so we're, it's not as substantiated as this exhibition is yet, but I'm very excited to embark on it. I, I, I consider myself to be a researching artist I'm very excited to embark on this new journey with these new collaborators. Anyone want to add anything else to that? What else are you guys are doing? Oh, well, outside of the collaboration, too. These guys have practices outside of what we do together. Well, I'll just, I'll just add a little bit to what you just teed out, but um, one of the things that I've been thinking about for a long time and that's now coming to the forefront in collaboration with these folks is the idea that, uh, that, that poetry, and actually all of language, is, is a technology in and of itself. And just the way that we kind of are able to walk around here and look at how technology is obsolescing, technology is changing, technology is being reincarnated, I'm really interested in thinking about um, kind of the overarching context and the deep history of human language, um, why, why it, you know, we invented it, um, how it's endured thus far, and what it may begin to look like in the near future, and then off into the distant future as it potentially transforms into something that we don't recognize anymore as human language. So I think I'm very, um, I'm, I actually got chills walking in here earlier today and seeing the show in person for the first time because it reflects so much of what I've been thinking about um, in terms of our, our, our linguistic future and our ability to communicate with each other and with our machines. 
um, and how that's changing and kind of looking around the room and seeing this manifest change and, um, and really feeling that and seeing it embodied in this way has given me a lot of um, food for thought, a lot of ideas um, for Let's how to collaborate. Let's <laughs> do it. It's so cool. Exactly. So, yeah, this, is, this has been really exciting to see it in person and to see just, yeah, just uh, how, how exciting this collaboration is going to be. One, one aspect that, that um, I'm very interested in uh, is uh, circular economy, as we, was mentioned before, with, working with Rebecca and, and, and Nathaniel uh, already a little bit and, and realizing um, that we need to get better at it. And since I'm a soil scientist, I'm interested in whatever could end up in the soil that is now ending up in water uh, or in a big hole somewhere. Um, and the, 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 the elephant in the room is, um, and it's not always nice to talk about it, is human shit and pee. Um, and uh, because we are flushing down more nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium uh, in a toilet than we add um, to agricultural soils as fertilizers. Uh, and, and so that, that we need to stop, um, and we need to figure out how we can recycle that. And that's, again, talking about the taboo, talking about um, uh, of human decision making, um, talking about talking about it. Um, that it's not really something that uh, my partner wants me to talk about on the, at the dinner table in the evening. You uh, can get no. technology to talk about it. Uh, yeah, technology I, gives a shit. Yes, <laughs> but she, technology she, she, is she knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I, I, I can't talk about what I'm thinking about. So um, there's a lot, lot to, uh, to, to deal with, and, and we started working on oh, children's books. Maybe we need to, this is, this is how change happens, maybe children's books is it. Um, what you mentioned, uh, no, the, the, the opposite pull is where we, we think that science is, is, is uh, rational and, and art is emotional, and I, and I, I think that's, we, need to, we need to unmask that. Um, uh, uh, that, that is, is something that we need to work on because um, uh, science uh, is definitely uh, as emotional as, as the arts and, and we're just not working on it. Uh, so there's a lot to oh, be You're done. always talking shit. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm not allowed to talk about concrete and dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, but, uh, uh, I have many other projects, many other projects going on, but I think uh, work with Nathaniel was always uh, uh, creative and inspiring, and uh, you know something outside of the box, which I really value. And uh, we don't have like strict plan; everything is uh, you know fluid and can change. But uh, this is what I'm trying to appreciate, and maybe to work with me on concrete furniture series. I think this is something which can be uh, uh, extremely interesting if we work together in this field because I can create something which is strong and durable and together with Nathaniel we can have very nice shapes together and, uh, and this can be something which uh, may have also practical application. So uh, something which everyone wants to have in their house, a piece of art, and I think this is what is going to be maybe a part of future collaboration, I hope. Yeah, it would be, to me, clear, because obviously concrete furniture would be difficult to transport. So the idea here would, it would actually be 3D printed concrete in, in situ. So you would bring and mix and print it where it lands. Yeah, one option. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Some other options. We have a little bit of time here for some questions, if, if y'all are willing to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so we do have a microphone here. So I know that that precludes people from upstairs from, from speaking at the microphone, so I can speak for you. But I want to make sure that we are able to use the mic because we're recording and we're live streaming. So I just want to make sure. And if anybody you know needs, needs the amplification so that they can hear. So if anybody's interested, feel free to step up to the microphone or raise your hand if you're upstairs and I'll repeat your question. Question. All right, you can raise your hand, I'll repeat your question. Okay, my question is what is this uh, installation going to do when it's moving out from here? Mm -hmm. Where is it going after, after yeah. this? Okay, here we go. 
go. Yeah, so this is a really good question. I get this a lot about, you know, am I contributing to the problem? So first I want to talk a little bit about where this waste comes from, and then I'll talk about where it goes. I work with UWM Surplus, so at the university we have a surplus office. They take um, faculty and graduate student computers that they've purchased when they're no longer being used by the students or faculty. The first thing they try to do is find another faculty member or graduate student who might use it. If they can't, because it's too old and not useful, the second thing they do is they try to sell it. Once they can't sell it, they then scrap it for the parts and recycle all those individual parts. So I step in in between those two moments when no one is using them anymore, but before they scrap it, that's when I take in and we have a really great deal where I get to use these for my art project. Um, right now, uh, this is the second iteration of the show. My hope is to exhibit it at least one more time, maybe two more times. I'm in discussion with uh, a couple of other, uh, another museum and another gallery that might show it. So these will go in storage in my studio um, just in case until such time as I exhibit it one or two more times. After that, it goes back to surplus. And in fact, um, we actually have a pile where we, did, we kind of sorted through. Since we've shown it twice now, we kind of know what we're using and what we might not use. And there's about 50 laptops that are going back to surplus and we're picking it up uh, on March, oh, today. We picked it up today. <laughs> we picked it up today. Um, and so they are still going to scrap those down and use them for the purpose. Uh, so we, we really don't want to add to the problem. There's a small chance, uh, you know, I'm a researching artist. I don't make my money from selling work, but I love it when I do sell work. Um, and so I, John and I were talking about this earlier. You know, there's a chance that a museum or a collection might want one of these towers, for example. In that case, 20% um, of that will go to surplus to help support their program. exciting stuff for me um, was while it was still in production um, and when uh, when people would make suggestions of things I might try. Um, so when we were planning, you know, have you tried stomach acid? Yes, I have. You know, would you like to freeze that in my you know, kiln? Would you like to burn that in my kiln? Yes, 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 yes. You know? And so um, those kinds of suggestions. In fact, the way I met Johannes was through my roommate from college, Julie Goddard, who's now a food science professor. I told her about what I was doing. She saw a story of Johannes' uh, new paralysis machine in the Cornell Magazine. She forwarded it to me and said, wouldn't it be cool if you could get this guy to cook your phones? And so I emailed him, and that's what happened. Uh, so those kinds of things, like even the first time I brought this to the Museum of Wisconsin Art, which is what it premiered at, it began as the sculptures. Um, and, and the phony prints, so for those of you who haven't walked through the exhibition, the utilities are actually made of waste. So these aluminum tools are actually old IMAX that have been melting down. Those prints are actually, the ink is made out of phones uh, that have been around. And she said to me, I, we're a museum, go bigger. Go, I, I don't want just these little sculptures. You know, I loved your last shot, I've done a, a solo show with them, and about 250 square meters of like, water lily stands. Um, and based on the Monet. And so I said, okay, give me a week. And she came back a week later, and that was the first iteration of the wall. It was just because she said, go big. And then we kept going, and we went to the tower. So I actually love um, when people make suggestions for me to build on, rather than being, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I, Garrett will tell you in my studio, anytime a student comes, even if I don't think it's a good idea, I won't tell them. I'll say, let's try it. Let's see, let's see what comes out. And my favorite is when, 
I didn't think it was going to work, and I didn't say anything, and they had to tell them to do it, and then it's awesome. Because um, some of those best ideas come from, you know, the, my students are my biggest inspiration. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming here and speaking today. Um, you, have, you said it earlier, has been nagging me this whole time of, of um, we have the solution, but the science is there. It's just a matter of people listening to it and doing it. And then what you said a little while ago about maybe we just need a children's book. Um, that, or that's one venue, one on-ramp to bringing this to people. And I've just been thinking a lot as we've been talking and looking around this beautiful exhibit of how um, you know, this is a self-selecting space. People are coming here to listen and to view this. And I'm curious how you all, um, you know, how you all bring your work outside the museum space, outside the maybe, um, you know, engineering, academic space that you all, you know, are primarily in, you know, outside those spaces. Because I think interacting with this is so important, but it is, um, I'm just curious how you see your work as interacting outside of just what we think of typical art spaces or typical science spaces. I, you Good question. Yeah, I, um, I obviously that I'm sitting here as a soil scientist is is already pretty odd, right? Um, <laughs> uh, Maybe you should talk about the soil thing. <laughs> and and yeah, and and so we. But, but it's testament to, to maybe a, a new way of thinking um, and that, that there's merit in it. And so um, it, it's happening more, but, but I think it's, it's, it's incipient. Um, and uh, and I, I still get, when I, when I say something about art science interactions, I, I still get this, oh, we need to make things pretty or, or let's not burden the students with problematic stuff. It should be uplifting. Um, it should not problematize uh, issues. And, and which belies a complete misunderstanding of what, what art is actually uh, trying to do and can accomplish. Um, and yeah, so good, good point. We, we, last year, we, uh, through happenstance with, with Rebecca together and, and Nathaniel joined in, we, we started something that's called the Soil Factory in Ithaca. Um, outside the university, also with the frustrations in mind that many things we cannot do within the university. Um, that, we, that we run, we call it the big red tape, um, if you know what Cornell stands for, you um, understand the, the pun. Uh, and, uh, and so we run against that all the time, and, and, and to the extent that uh, some people say, yeah, go outside the university, and, and of course that, no. you do that, and then all of a sudden a lot of things open up. But still, it is interesting how, how separate we think and, and how separate the different people are, are, um, are uh, thinking and, and, and acting. I, I find it very interesting. We, for instance, in one week, we had a, a carbon sequestration workshop, uh, an electric um, uh, uh, avant-garde um, concert, um, uh, movie time, and there was another thing. And I think none of the, the people that were there um, went to any of the others. Um, it's really it's still it's still very separate communities that do one thing or the other. Um, even if we're trying to provide a platform that that um, allows everyone to play, um, and uh, so I think there's still a long way to go. Um, and it's still you know, viewed as odd. Uh, what are you doing there? Do you even belong? I'll jump in really quickly too. Just okay. My my perspective as a poet, I'll add that to this as well because um, you know I started off as a very I guess conventional poet, and that means trying to publish in literary journals that get a you know readership of maybe maybe a couple hundred people if you're lucky. And so there's something very disheartening about wanting to write something and then knowing that it's it's basically going to disappear or not find any readership beyond this very self-selecting group. And so. Um, a lot of my interest actually in using technology for poetry and, and especially lately in exploring uh, crypto and the blockchain as a place to publish and distribute poetry has a lot to do with this desire to push beyond the, you know, the usual readership, the usual audience and, and basically take poetry to people where they are already living and working and playing, which to be honest is not always in a bookstore and it's usually not in a literary journal. 
So the idea that you could you know, package some of these ideas that we're talking about and turn them into a video game, or take citizen science and you know, partner with an amazing data visualization artist like Rafik Anadol and create a multimedia installation that takes over an entire building in Brooklyn, which he has done a number of times. I think you know, there's so many ways that we can really um, create, uh, create experiences, especially hybrid experiences, I think, that really give people a chance who are just walking by down the street to kind of poke their head in and discover something. Same thing online. I think, again, it's you know, creating um, the, the access point for a lot of this uh, information, making it appealing, making it really fun, maybe gamifying it, making it artful, and then making sure that people um, from a very, very wide group have access to it, which I think, again, is something that both Nathaniel and I have been exploring quite a lot on the blockchain, how to do that ethically, how to do it responsibly, how to really you know, um, do it in a, in a genuinely decentralized way, in an eco-friendly way at the same time, but really using um, that, um, that kind of democratizing um, platform to take these ideas and make them really, um, really accessible, to use that word again, I think is extremely, uh, extremely important. I'm going to jump in and say, yeah, this is a small slice of what I do. Um, I write for the mainstream press as well as academic books. I just got an EA grant to work with more diverse communities in and around uh, making them more comfortable in the workplace through creativity. Um, I do workshops in public schools around art and technology, and I just started a DAO, for those of you who know what it is, whose sole goal is to make the blockchain carbon negative and teach exactly how much energy is being used up and then sequester carbon in the highest quality ways in response to that, as well as move towards proof of state versus proof of work. So I, I'm 100% behind that. Um, there's different audiences, like some of the work I make is for Wired magazine as well as museums, like this. Some of them I make is for like three people who read the same uh, paper on Deleuze that also love their picture and that, that not as much as I do. And like, you know, some of it is, is for my mom. And I try to reach as many audiences as I can, both through my art and writing and workshops and more. And I, I mean, we can't do it. We just, and I, I don't say that as a complaint. I say it as a reality. And so I'm 100% behind challenging myself in, in the way that you're asking us to, to, to make that impact. And in fact, we were talking earlier, how do I decide which project? I've got a billion ideas, I've got a billion people like Bradley, I've got five children. How do I decide what work I'm going to do? Well, is it fun and interesting? Do I get to work with fun and interesting people? How much impact will it have? And then I prioritize on those two questions. So there's one more question. I think we have time for one more question, so go ahead. Um, yeah, so I have a question going back to, you mentioned keeping your phone like one extra year. Now looking at all these old laptops. So there's methods to, to like lengthen the life of it, um, but over time it degrades, gets slower. And I feel like a lot of people think of like the technology as transactional and not so much as relationship and how that machine typically changes over time and what we expect how you can nurture it to actually extend it. So I guess one point, do we do you feel a pressure to or inspired to try to convince people to have a more personal relationship with like that technology? Or do you think you just put more time into developing systems of collecting and refurbishing or recycling? Okay, so that so help me make sure that I I mean have Summarize your your question. So so should we should we put more time into creating encouraging people to create relationships with their technology, or should we put time into refurbishment and uh, reuse of technology? Yeah, is that, is that fair? Yeah. I, my, my quick response would be that I, I think it's less of a well first it's less of a binary than than that right like of course. There is, um, like one of those is our intimate relationship, as I mentioned, the other is a system of how we deal with it. But second, it's le I think it's less a personal relationship with the technology and more a personal re relationship with that waste. When, when we have to understand this thing as garbage, and, and not just like, you know, blackberries as garbage, but everything we use as garbage. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm here until tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, understanding that the, these these it's matter that matters. That you know everything in that thing, like even. I didn't get into like the kinds of safety training I had to go through to make this work, right? Like I got, that stuff was actually cooked in that air fryer, right? Like do you know what the danger is that is? But like that's precisely the kinds of questions that I want people asking. Like that's not only dangerous just because it's a man, right? That material is something we were going to put in the ground. Um, and so understanding, and I, I think these two things are inherently interconnected, right? Understanding our personal relationship to that garbage is going to change a personal relationship to that technology and to how we think of those systems of care. Like most of us know how our government officials think about Ukraine right now. But how many of us can even name our local state senator, much less know where they stand on e -list? We should. We have to. We have to do that. Does anybody else want to jump in? I was going to say Sasha, right. you can do it. Do it. Sorry. Sorry. Bring us all the session. No, no, good at it. Um, no, I just have to say I thought that was a really beautiful and beautifully stated question. And the idea of nurturing a technological device, I think, is really poignant and quite fascinating to think about. I don't believe I've, you know, heard that phrase before. But to kind of bring this back around to the idea of stakes, I do think that that's something that is very, very important um, to think more about. Is is the human relationship to our technology? Maybe not literally as you know, the relationship between me and the computer, but how much of our technology is human and how much it mirrors everything that we're putting into it. And so for example, for me, the stakes of working with AI have a lot to do with the fact that most of us don't really know what goes into our AI. We speak of it as this, this closed system that just exists or that is you know, trained and we have no access to understand how it's made or you know, when, when things happen because of that AI and it targets certain groups that are being surveilled, or it, you know, makes, um, you know, horrific biased assumptions based on all the training data. You know, we need to understand that that's because that's that's because of our human relationship with that technology. It's reflecting what we're putting into it. So we do need to nurture a really, we need to nurture a much better relationship with our technologies in lots of ways. And I think that's a really good reminder. And this is a great manifestation of that. And it, it happens on so many levels from the literal to you know, the things that you can't see that are not quite as tangible. So thank you for the question. Yeah, that's a good I think that's a really great note to end up. So I've got two announcements. And but let's first of all clap for this. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for a fantastic <laughs>